I think there's just, there is so much to learn and so much to absorb um, where I am now that I don't think I'm going to be getting bored in the next five years, that's for sure. Welcome to Ecology Matters, a podcast from the Ecological Society of Australia. In each episode, meet a different ecologist, discover what makes them passionate about Australian ecology, what their hopes and fears are for the future of our natural world, and why they think that ecology really does matter. It's, it's really about pursuing one's curiosity and one's passion. I wanted to understand more of the mechanisms behind these things. I could see what I could contribute to make it a better place. I instantly fell in love with more folk. It's an amazing result to start with and uh, promising leading to our next experiments. I have to feel it's making a difference. I often feel like I have the best job in the world. <laughs> it's absolutely huge. It's been so wonderful. <laughs> Our guest to this episode is Dr Heather Neely. Dr Neely is a postdoctoral researcher with the Australian Landscape Trust, based at Kelperham Station in South Australia. Her work focuses on how disturbances can alter the structure of vegetation and affect fauna. With colleagues, she is looking at how features such as spinifex grass perform as thermal refuges for small reptiles and mammals under a range of different fire and grazing treatments. Heather was awarded the 2021 Wiley Next Generation Ecologist Award. I grew up with parents that were interested in camping and, you know, taking us us out into the bush. And my dad's actually a geologist, so we got dragged along on various expeditions to, you know, look for rocks and, and fossils and things um, with him. I mean, I actually, I grew up in a city, I grew up in Adelaide, you know, very close to the CBD, but... There was about three years in my childhood, so from about um, six to nine years old, we actually lived in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, and I think that period of, of my childhood was very formative, um, just being immersed in that, you know, in that landscape really gave me a love of semi-arid and arid systems. Um, you know, you could you could see how the, the soil and the vegetation and the animals all sort of were interwoven and and you know the more time you spent there you actually got to see how things changed you know whether it be how things responded to rainfall or um just you know how vegetation communities changed as the soil changed and I think that just you know really sparked a curiosity in me I don't think I you know, at the time realised I was making those observations, but yeah, it just sparked a curiosity about, how, you know, how does this all work and how is this all connected? And then at some stage, probably in primary school, when I realised that science was the vehicle to actually answer some of these questions about, about how these systems work, yeah, that's when I was, I was hooked. And there was, there was no other option for me at that point. Did you have any um, mentors in your childhood? Like you said, your, your father was a geologist, but did you have any other adults around you or even people that were well-known that really inspired you to go into ecology specifically? I think that influence of, of my father was was really huge and he taught me to notice to notice things and, and observe small things and take note of, of everything around me. So I think he was definitely my biggest impact. Of course, you know, I watched all the David Attenborough docos and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think probably truly that that curiosity and that ability to to make observations, I think that's that's from my dad. And why did you choose your particular field? I guess first of all, could you explain what sort of projects you work on and why you got interested in them? I'm a terrestrial ecologist only. <laughs> I don't I don't get my feet wet at all. And so I'm primarily interested in how disturbances shape the structure and um, composition of vegetation communities and then how that influences other species like, you know, faunal species, for example. And so I guess the, the reason why I moved in that direction was... Um, like I said, as, as a child, that, that curiosity was sparked and it was just a very natural sort of direction for me to move in. Um, after I did my honours, I spent 
probably most of my 20s working in various ecology roles um, around Australia. So I worked in consulting, I worked in mining, I worked in local government. And I, in, in each of those settings, I guess I, I saw the same thing. I saw people trying to manage land with um, limited knowledge and, you know, that understanding wasn't necessarily available to them. And, you know, we're, disturbances like fire and grazing and flooding, you know, these kind of things are what's actually changing how, you know, the patterning and the ecological processes that are happening in these landscapes. And so to, to various extents, we can actually manage and manipulate those disturbances. So understanding how disturbance changes things within the system to me seemed as, you know, a fundamental way to actually manage and restore landscapes um, more effectively. The project um, that's particularly associated with um, this award is actually looking at how um, we manage fire and grazing to um, maximise outcomes for biodiversity, essentially. And so I'm working in the, the Mallee Woodlands on Calperham Station, where, where I work with the Australian Landscape Trust. And um, we're looking at, at how fire and grazing um, impact on the thermal refuges that are available to reptiles. And so it's a um, very applied research question and hopefully that can then feed back into how we make decisions about fire and grazing on Calperham and, and also, you know, provides information for, for other landscapes. And you, you've worked in connection with a lot of other organisations with, with NGOs and other pastoralist partners. Have you, have you found that they're quite receptive to your work? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, partnerships have, have been critical with pretty much all of the work that I've done. So working with NGOs, with governments, um, with pastoralists, with First Nations groups, especially when you're operating over large scales and large, you know, landscapes, that kind of collaboration is really, really critical. You're pooling your knowledge, your, your experiences, your resources. Um, so it can definitely, you know, be really beneficial. For example, um, at the Australian Landscape Trust, we, we have Calprom and Taylorville stations um, in the Riverland region of South Australia. So together they're about 300,000 hectares. And, you know, we can do research and management on our properties and that's fine. But if we're acting as, a, as an island, so for example, say we're doing um, feral animal management on our property and, and putting lots of time and resources into that, but no one around us is, is doing anything in terms of controlling, you know, goats and rabbits and foxes and cats, etc. We could be, you know, wasting our resources and not getting the best outcomes. But um, in our situation here, we've actually got this alliance with all of our neighbouring properties. So some of these properties are managed by state government, by other NGOs, by universities, um, pastoralists, and also the First Nations group here. And so we now are able to collaborate with all these people and do research and do management across 1 million hectares of Mallee woodland. So it really helps when you have everyone coming along with you on the ride. And it's definitely not um, me trying to just um, push my agenda onto other people, but you just get, you get so much back from, from everyone sharing all their experience um, and all the different, I guess, angles that they're coming from and what they bring to a project. That idea that, that research can be done outside of universities, in other organisations, in other ways. And I, I think with a diversity of roles, it will attract and, and retain a diversity of researchers and a diversity of ecologists, which I think is what we, you know, can only be a good thing if we have different people from different perspectives all contributing to our our knowledge of ecology that's only going to give us better outcomes. And would, would you consider yourself an early career ecologist? 
Yes, I am, definitely. Um, I graduated in 2018, so I would call myself an early career ecologist. As, as an ECE, yep. what are some of the challenges that you, you feel that you have faced as an ECE and how ECEs more broadly face? I suppose I should only speak for myself and maybe others can relate to my challenges as well. Um, it's, they're probably pretty standard, but just uh, for me, the the juggle of, of trying to raise a family um, and I think as an early career researcher, you certainly feel a lot of pressure that you still, still have to prove yourself um, at this point in your career. What has particularly worked for me, I guess, is having an employer who's who's really flexible and so I can manage um, my work and my life in a flexible way which is, has really helped me and I suppose as well what I have really benefited from is having examples of other people particularly for me it's it's more sort of women who have children you know seeing um examples of their pathways that might not be the most sort of traditional pathway in in research and in ecology and just having those examples showcased and having them out there has given me the confidence to forge my own pathway as well. Ecology Matters is a podcast by the Ecological Society of Australia, a not-for-profit organisation supporting ecologists and ecological science in Australia. We acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. To learn more about our work, follow us on social media, visit our website or sign up to our newsletter. You can find links to these in the show notes. This episode was produced by Grace Heathcote and Elodie Compressi. The theme music is Glow by Scott Buckley. Lastly, thank you to all the ecologists who have taken part in this series and shared their perspectives on why ecology matters.